Hillman Realty provides real estate services in Santa Clara, San Mateo, San Francisco, and Contra Costa counties. Whether you're getting ready to buy or sell, in the middle of it, or just looking for some answers, we are here to help. Our goal is to provide the best insight, tools, and deliver the best financial results. Our innovative listing plan benefits our clients by providing a full-service MLS listing without paying the high real estate commissions. Our home buying plans are also designed to pass huge savings to our buyers. To learn more about our special offers and services, please either visit our website, www.ramanrealty.com, or contact Raman Mirzapur at 408-499-8957. Email raman at ramanrealty.com. Pay the lowest fees, sell for the highest price, and net maximum proceeds. The title of this breakout session is The Role of the Diaspora in, and in Sustaining Assyrian Communities in Iraq. Um, and, you know, we have the pleasure of these three very wonderful people joining us. Um, Dr. Antoine Barani, did I say that right? Yes. Okay. Sabina Dawood and Rana, and they're going to, um, what's up? Louder? Can, okay, I'll, sp I'll try to speak louder. Um, and so we have them joining us. I'm going to let them also introduce themselves. Um, and yeah, we're gonna get started with our first presenter, so go on ahead. Hi everyone, uh, my name is uh, Dr. Antoine Vorani. I'm the president of Assyrian Aid Society of America, and uh, we're gonna start. So imagine having a nightmare, being in a room with a dentist giving a presentation. <laughs> I'm a dentist giving you a presentation on Assyrian Aid Society. We're going to start. Um, just by show of hands, how many of you uh, know the projects a certain, about the Serenade Society and the projects that we've done? And oh, that's oh, perfect. Okay, so some of these um, uh, I'm going to go through them quickly because um, I didn't really know how to gauge my audience. I didn't know who was going to be here, so. Um, some of these will be a little uh, quicker and then a little quick introduction and then we're going to get to the main, uh, main section. So the mi mission statement uh, for Assyrian Aid Society, uh, we have several of them and one of them is helping Assyrian which goes with the humanitarian part of Assyrian Aid Society. That's given. But also uh, we have taken the responsibility like many of the organizations here uh, including API, which I want to thank uh, for, for actually, I'm sorry, for um, organizing this, uh, this conference. It's really not an easy thing to do, to have all these speakers, all these guests, and for over a few days, you guys have done an absolutely wonderful job. So um, thank you for this. And I'm so proud. And I'm so proud to be sitting here with two wonderful ladies, two great organizations. Um, that uh, we do work together, so I want you to, uh, I want you guys to know this. Uh, the other um, part of the uh, mission statement is um, promoting our heritage and culture. Things. What I'm really proud of, and what really got me into Assyrian Aid Society, are the schools that are sponsored by Assyrian Aid Society. Uh, currently, we have 26 schools. Majority of them have curriculums that are completely taught in Assyrian language. And I was there two months ago, and it was a beautiful sight to see. It, from you know, first grade to, to 12th grade, they're all studying in our language. It, it was absolutely something out of this world. And uh, uh, many of you have been there, have seen this. But the other, other cultural section of this is events like Mesopotamia Night that we have in San Jose area. 
we have um, Ashur Nasir Park Gala in, in Chicago, and I've been there. I highly recommend it for those of you who haven't been there. Uh, you have dinner when La Masu is, is right there next to you at the Oriental Institute, so it's, it's amazing. Um, <clears throat> mobilizing and responding to crisis, and you all know we always have this. Crisis are, unfortunately, has always been part of our history, and um, organizations, humanitarian organizations like ours here, we're always there to help. Uh, focusing American and international attention to our cause. API does a wonderful job. Um, tonight, actually, Assyrian Aid Society has an event, and we've invited a lot of um, Assyrian leaders and non-Assyrian leaders. And we have shifted our focus, even though this has always been part of Assyrian Aid Society mission, we have, a, we have put a new energy and focus into this, and tonight's event is an example of that. I think this is the first event we've had in uh, DC, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, this is just an introduction. It's basically we have uh, uh, Arizona chapter, Central Valley chapter. Actually, I'm going to take this moment to thank my wife, who is, has always been a great supporter of me. Uh, I always come up with crazy ideas, and uh, she's always a supporter. And she's the president of Central Valley uh, chapter. We have Chicago chapter, Los Angeles, Michigan, San Jose, and DC chapter. We were talking about crisis. Um, this uh, Assyrian Society was established in 1991. We are celebrating our 30th anniversary. Because of COVID, we're going one year forward. Um, it started, we were talking about crisis, and it started because of the uh, Gulf, Gulf War in uh, 1991. And as you can see, there are plenty of crises. Every, every year there was something. And uh, we have the um, uh, Gulf War, the second one, and then we had the ISIS, and we had the COVID uh, pandemic. And you all know it's not just these, uh, these big um, events that we hear about, you all know there's, there's daily bombing, uh, Turkish bombings. And we always have these issues that uh, not everyone hears about and organization like ours uh, have to deal with. And what am I doing on time? Um, <clears throat> so our focus in the Syrian Aid Society is education, which I mentioned, infrastructure and rebuilding. Uh, we have many many projects of rebuilding houses uh, for our people that are damaged specifically uh, you know during war during ISIS with Turkish bombing um, we uh, just recently finished building six houses in Chakalla Barwar region um, and that was for not just help the farmers have a home so they don't have to commute to those areas but it was also a uh, one of the land grabbing issues that uh, you all know, know about. Uh, jobs and economic stability, that I will get back to um, because it, it falls into what we're going to talk about. Uh, refugee and disaster relief. Um, during COVID, uh, in 2020, a Syrian Aid Society was recognized by um, Iraqi government as one of the top humanitarian organizations uh, helping with COVID. We were able to um, team up a lot of Assyrian people donated, but we also teamed up with USAID to give uh, care packages and uh, food packages to our, to our people, Assyrians and non-Assyrians. Uh, health and safety, we have a mobile, mobile clinic that goes from village to village, um, helping our uh, sick and in, people in need. Some of the projects that we have completed, and um, again, the reason for, for this is to show you that a certain aid society has been doing this for 30 years, and part of the focus is not just immediate help, but it's also enabling our people so that they can stand on their own feet and be able to um, uh, support themselves. And you guys all know we have many, many successful people in Natra. It's not like you know everyone is in need, um, but 
obviously our focus is to help the ones in need and enable them to have a better future. Uh, I explained about uh, mobile clinic, uh, food distribution. To be honest with you, this is the least um, uh, project that I like. It's just uh, our people are not beggars. And when we give them food, it's not enabling them to stand on their feet and be able to have a good future. It, we do this when we have to. We did this during COVID, but it's not something that I personally want to promote, and I'm sure the board doesn't want to promote. This is not something we want to do, but sometimes we have designated um, donations, and that's what the donors want, and that's why we, we do this sometimes. And this mostly is during Christmas time. Uh, building new homes, I explained that. Repair and construction of irrigation. Irrigation channels is something we have done many, many years. And it enables farmers to be more efficient uh, with their farming. Supporting new businesses uh, with the help of USAID, we were able to, uh, I think, rebuild about 90 shops uh, in Ninwa region. The challenges, the population, and I'm, I'm actually going to go to the next one because that will explain more about uh, I knew this, but it became really clear when I, w I went to Atra. We are outnumbered, outspent, out-earned, out, uh, under-resourced. And in any country, including Iraq, our people, are, we, especially the young people, we lose our language. We are starting to lose. We are losing our culture. Culture not as quickly as the language, but I noticed people from Iran speak Farsi, even though they're Assyrian. People from Iraq speak Arabic, Kurdish. Here we speak English, and uh, that is a big problem. Um, <clears throat> not going to get into churches. Um, a decrease in nationalistic pride. There's a big movement. This is hope. As, uh, Assyrian Policy Institute, I mean, we, we saw this, and we have so many young people. This is really hopeful. To see. This is really hopeful, and it's really nice to see. Uh, but in general, we do see a decline, and um, hopefully by working together, we will at least slow down this process. Um, political seats in Iraq, you guys know we lost our... Uh, political uh, seat, and hopefully we can change that. We'll see. Um, but what we can do here, working in DC with, with different politicians, what the Syrian Aid Society is doing, we, will not, we are not politicians. We do not get into politics. But as a humanitarian organization, we will fight for the right of our people when they um, grab our lands illegally that's part of humanitarian organization. That's part of humanitarian rights. So we will fight for that. But we will leave the political part to other organizations like Assyrian Policy Institute. Uh, melting pot, I explained that. Um, no, I have here no leadership to represent all Assyrians. Realistically, if you have pi five people you put them in a room, they will never agree on, on politics and the way it should run. So it's unrealistic to, have, to say that, okay, we're going to have one leader and he's gonna rep or he or she will represent our nation. What's realistic is to have, we have 10 le organizations, let's say. They have 10 leaders. One of those leaders is starting to get lead and is able, act is able to represent our Assyrian nation. The other nine should either support him or just back off and let one person do it. That's the only way we can, we can make progress. Otherwise, by trying, by trying to go against that one, one person who actually has made some progress, we've seen what, happened, what, what has happened the past 100 years. You know, they promise us land from World War I till now. They promise us we fought for different countries, and at the end, they didn't give us anything. So 
our only, our only hope is to actually go behind that one person. Even if we don't agree, there are times we will not agree, but we have to be able to work together. Our solution is connecting what Gishru, this is what Gishru does, and I really respect him for that, is connecting our Western countries to homeland. And um, I, I saw a lot of uh, people from Gishru that are here today. There's a lot of them who come and help Assyrian Aid Society because they've seen what Assyrian Aid Society is doing, and the only way they were able to do this is by, Gish, by uh, help of Gishru. And this is what I mean by, you know, uh, we have so many issues and we're trying as a humanitarian organization to help in different ways. One th nice thing about other organizations, non assyrian organizations, is, okay, this organization will focus on farming. This will focus on a certain problem. With us, unfortunately, we are in education, we are in uh, humanitarian, medicine, land grabbing, we're trying to do as much as we can. Um, <clears throat> but economic stability is something that we really should focus on. As I explained, we have a lot of issues, we're outnumbered, we can't really do much uh, with that. But we can do is make, create opportunities for our people in homeland so that they are able to stand, for, stand up for themselves and they can, in return, help other people. Um, I explained, already explained uh, fighting inside and outside uh, of homeland to be able to help our uh, nation. Uh, one thing I think it's really important is we always guess how many Assyrians are in each country and uh, uh, their socioeconomic situation. This is one of those uh, where I just give an idea, but I have no idea who can uh, undertake that project. But if we were able to collect data from all the Assyrians in the world, we would have a good, clear number of how many Assyrians we have and what they're capable of doing and their, their skills. And that's one way to be able to uh, help us just like uh, Israel did. That's really, I think, having a, that data and uh, numbers will help us. Uh, that's perfect, because I'm done. Um, and actually, that's all, that's all I have. Uh, if you guys have any questions about the Serenade Society, um, or if you want to volunteer, we, I, as I explained, we have different chapters. Um, so please just uh, come up, and I'll help you guys. Thank you. Um, my name is Savina Dawood. Um, I was born and raised in Erbil. I studied primary and high school in Assyrian schools of Ur and Erbaillo and Erbil Ankawa. And I obtained my bachelor degree in business and management in Erbil. And then I pursued higher education masters in human rights in Germany. Um, I have two children, Hakari and Isla. They're at home now with their father, and I'm only able to be here today because my husband is very supportive, which is something that I'm very, very happy to see nowadays, Assyrian men supporting Assyrian women, standing behind them, helping them, allowing them, enabling them to be able to represent and do our work. So I want to shout out to all the supportive men that are supporting Assyrian women too. Um, in 2014, when ISIS invaded uh, Nineveh, more than 100,000 of our people from Nineveh, they fled to northern regions, to Erbil, to Nohadra, and they, were, they did not have a place to stay, they did not have food, they just ran. They took whatever they could grab, and that was mostly just their documents and identifications, the, their money, their gold, and they just ran. Some of them could, did not even have the chance to do that. So when that happened, um, I and some other friends, we started immediately to do something because it was in my city. We just started getting groups and groups, hundreds and thousands of people just coming in, coming in. So we immediately started helping with the basic needs. Shelter, where do we put these people? Cold water, because it was June and August in Iraq. Um, that's 50 degrees Celsius. Um, we looked 
there were so many pregnant women, so many um, patients of diabetes. How do we help those people? What do we do? How, and that's what we started first doing, which later on led to the uh, establishment of E2T Institute um, among those friends together. And then one night, as we were sitting at one of the IDP camps and planning for the next day to bring some doctors to check on some pregnant women, some patients of diabetes, and then prescribe them what they need, check on the baby, what's going on, if we need to take them to the hospital. There was this little girl, she was about three, four years old with her two cousins. Her name was Mina. And as we were sitting like planning, I'm just paying attention to what they're doing. And sorry, this presentation went off. Oh, okay. She's telling her cousin, uh, I'm going to be at home. Uh, you're going to be Daesh. Daesh means ISIS in Arabic. You're going to come and kidnap me. And then Faris has to come and rescue me. They were playing a game called Daesh. And then I was so shocked. I'm like, what are they doing? And they're playing a game of Daesh. And I saw it happening commonly among the children. It, it's like hide and seek, like what we saw Grace doing with her father, trying to train her. They created a game out of such a hardship that they were going through. And in that second, I said, OK, guys, we need to shift our focus. There are other organizations that are doing humanitarian, that are doing basic needs, they're uh, providing all of this shelter, and we need to start on healing, recovering, building those people. And that's when we were able to shape our mission together and focus to educate, enable, and empower our young people, our women, our children, and the indigenous Assyrian families that are living um, in our ancestral lands. And that's what we wanted to focus on. That's how we put all of our ideas together. <clears throat> our projects are categorized under 10 different categories. We have academia, skill building, where we train our people on different skills, careers and jobs and economic stability, development, where in places where they need projects to develop the rural areas and the villages mainly, human rights, um, giving. This is mainly for Christmas times um, because, again, this Mina, because it was a smaller camp that we were at, so I, I saw her like on daily basis. So I was just asking her, like, so what do you, what are you guys, you know, what do you want for Christmas? What, what are we doing for Christmas? And some boy there, he's like, oh, I want to get a Kalashnikov that's like a type of weapon um, to kill ISIS, and then we can go back home. And then Mina was like, yeah, yeah, me too. And I was like, okay, guys, let's, let's think of, like, what do you want to, like, let's do something fun. Let's, you know, let's, do you want toys? What do you want toys? Like, and they were like, yeah, well, I can get a doll. And then, oh, okay, I can get a ball. So it was just very traumatic for them to go all through that, but they were dealing with it as a very normal thing. And then they're just making, um, living through it as if it's a daily life thing asking for weapons for Christmas so they can liberate their region and go back to their homes. So that's when we started the project of giving. We, until now, we have distributed more than 25,000 gifts for children. Every Christmas we do that. We, thank you. We visited every single IDP camp, whether it was in Erbil, in Nohadra. We even gave more than 4,000 gifts for Yazidi uh, children who were also in their camps. Every single IDB camp, we've been there um, on Christmas. We have given them gifts. We have celebrated Christmas together. And then we have history and heritage. We have a lot of um, sites in Iraq. We want to educate our uh, young people about it, um, even the Kurds Arabs that live there, because it's very important that the Arabs and Kurds that are living with us there, the Yazidis, the Turkmen, all of the other minorities as well, and other indigenous people that we have, to learn about this, the history of that land, because we don't learn about it in our educational system. All of the schools, we do not learn about Assyrian history. They think that, okay, there's like one small paragraph, you know, it says Assyrians were here, and that's it. They do not represent us as we're still there, we still live there, we're the indigenous people, 
none of that exists in our educational system. So we have to step up and educate our people and the neighbors that are living with us because it's important that they also know so that we can live together and they respect who we are. We're not refugees from Hakkari. That's what they think, most of us, uh, they're from Hakkari. Well, th this border of Iraq is something new established. Hakkari and Barwar, they're all the same for us. It's all our ancestral land that is in today's world, the new countries that was forced upon us, these borders. And then we have arts, uh, we have sports and friendship. This was also established when during um, IDP camps because we, we noticed that our young people and our children, every time we approached them in the IDP camp, they were limited with what they wanted, their desires, their wishes, because they are in camps, they are in tents, they're in caravans. But as soon as we took them out of there, they were a different person. They were able to think, they were able to be free, they were able to liberate from the limitations they had at the IDP camps. So that's what we started doing. We started taking young people outside of the camps. We would take them to like a soccer field and we would divide it to different sections. Each section had like two games and like one topic to discuss. And these games had like a little twist. So for example, that would make them think even further. So one game was like, let's say, the traditional football or soccer, as it's known here. Um, if you score one goal and that's it, your role is done, you cannot score another goal. You have to assist someone else to score that goal. So the purpose of that game was we must help each other to achieve our goals. We can't just, you know, reach our goals and then, you know, keep further. We need to help each other as a community, all of us together, we need to reach our goals and that's when we have to be that's when we will be successful so that's what we would do with the young people there and then later we would talk about a topic um, why are we here why are you displaced today what are we doing here how can we uh, fix our situations another topic would be like about gender inequalities why are our women treated like this how can we change that where does it start from and then what we would do is after like one week or two weeks of this program now we would bring the children out in the same soccer field. But this time, it wouldn't be us doing these topics and games and presentations. It would be the young people we trained two weeks before. And that's where enabling and empowering those young people happened. So they, because they felt that they were somehow disabled when they were in those IDP camps. But when you give them the material, when you enable them, when you show them that me and you are exactly the same, the only difference is that I am at home and you are not. And that is it. That does not define your identity. That's only your situation, what you're going through right now. But that's not who you are. And that's how we were able to enable each other. In this presentation, I'm going to go very fast because I'm running out of time. But I'm going to focus on the first three categories, academia, skill building, and careers and jobs, um, with a few projects that we have within these categories. One project that I personally am so, 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 so happy, it's like a dream coming true for me, it's Nabu Educational Awards. This pro project is designed to support Assyrian students um, who are not able to continue their education in a way. Um, and we give grants for them. So that goes towards their tuition and also educational supplies that they need, such as laptops, for example. Um, it started in December 2018 and the first grants were given in 2019. We gave eight uh, university students laptops. Um, that's also because of the donations that we had. And then the next year, we reached out to organizations and we were able to give grants for 31 university students to be able to do one year of their um, uh, tuition, their study tuition. And then the year after, thank you. And the year after, we supported 21 students from Armenia, because Assyrians in Armenia are seriously going through some very, very hard conditions. We need to focus on them as well. Um, 2015, uh, 2021, we had 15 university students to receive laptops. And then this year, just uh, the beginning of this year, we were able to support, again, 31 students who received scholarship for a whole year. And this is like a contract we have with their universities. The money is directly sent to the universities and they don't have to worry about it. So until today, since 2018, we were able to provide 83 uh, grants to students and 23 laptops for students. And hopefully we will be able to do this every year and this number will keep increasing so we can have a good generation 
of educated Assyrians and well equipped to be able to work. The other uh, program that we have within the skill building and development is E2T annual leadership program that I just came back from um, in Iraq. We do this every year. It's a three to four day uh, program that we go to an Assyrian village and we have Assyrian young people from all different sides of Iraq and sometimes even from outside Iraq. We've had from Khabur, we've had from America, from Australia, from Germany to join us. Um, we focus on workshops of leadership and communication skills. We do skill building trainings like this year in Ninwe. We talk about how to write your CV, how to apply for a job, how to uh, write professional emails. And together with that, we have um, community service projects that the young participants get to be part of that and um, practice what they just learned in those workshops. Because trainings are important, but if you don't practice those skills, you will forget them very easily. Um, and also we focus on <coughs> the importance of land, of the environment, of the agriculture there, and how farming is a very blessed career and a very important career, one of the first careers in the world, and how is it important for us and essential as indigenous people in Iraq, especially in those lands that we have land theft uh, problems there. In 2017, that's when we started the program, it was in Barwar, and 2018, it was in Nala. We helped building the Shaqisha there, uh, the water canal that spreads through the agricultural lands. Um, in 2019, we had the biggest number there. Uh, it was in Sersing. And in 2021, it was in Bebede. And I was there as well. I'm so happy that I made it. And this year, it was in Ninwe, uh, in, in Baghdede and Karamlesh, two towns that we have in Ninwe. Since 2017, when we started this program up to today, we were able to have 25 young people who have participated in this, and we were able to complete 19 community service projects. What are these community service projects? Some of them are, for example, this year in Karamlesh, uh, one of uh, their churches, Mar Day in Karamlesh, they had their Zagat Umrah, the church bell, it was destroyed by ISIS. In Al Hadiya, until now, it wasn't uh, fixed and we were able to help them to uh, fix that. Um, and in Bebeda, for example, we were able to also uh, build um, or create a um, volleyball field for young people to gather and play volleyball there. We have another training program, um, Let's Drive for Women. We did it for the first time in 2018, I think. Um, a Syrian woman from Ninwe were more limited with what they were doing because they were surrounded by more Islamic communities. So they weren't as liberated as a Syrian woman in northern regions. But through this um, displacement, when they came to our cities to Erbil and Nuhadra, that was a very big change in how um, women is seen, how women is treated in our communities in Dashta. And that was a good and positive change for us, even though we went through that hardship, but it had some good outcome from it as well. Um, so we put an application for, we thought we had prepared a budget for like 20 women. So we were like maximum like 30 will apply. We had more than 350 women wow. apply. So this project will continue this year. We're gonna take more women and then hopefully we can even have more and more uh, participants with us. And we also uh, focus on computer skills training because that's the number one training that you need to get any job to be able to finish your um, thesis if you want to do masters or if you're even graduating from bachelors. Um, we've done it in Khabur and Ninwe and actually tomorrow we'll start in Sapna for the first time um, that uh, holds more than eight uh, villages in Sapna region. We're gonna start computer training for six days, a heavy training on Excel, Word, um, uh, how to write emails and all the necessity uh, tools that you need to have a job to be in your career. Um, and we're also gonna have it in Ninwe um, next month. Um, Armenia, how much time do I have? Like, what? I'm done. Okay, sorry. I'm just going to conclude. Yeah. Um, and Armenia, we were able to go for two weeks, and uh, we helped the young Assyrians there to build an organization, to start an organization on their own. 
Uh, we train them on how to run the organization, how to have an organizational structure, how to write proposals, um, how to uh, use Excel Word. We bought them laptops, we bought them printer, we brought them a projector so they can be able to do it on their own, not to depend on others. And um, careers and jobs, we have helped a lot of young people to start their careers. Um, so far, 16 uh, young Assyrians have been able to start their careers. Uh, we give them capital um, to be able to do it and marketing. And we have until now enabled and empowered six indigenous Assyrian families to be able to have their own ways to generate income, whether it is buying uh, sheep or uh, building a sheepfold for them or buying cows, whatever that they need that ge generates income for them to be able to stay on our lands. Because it's important that we're building houses, we're building those, uh, but we need to enable those people so they're able to stay there, they're able to live there and they're not only just living there, but they're able to prosper. Because if you're not prospering, you're just surviving every day, that, that's not how we should be living. So we want our people to be able to strive, like to, sorry, to thrive in these regions, specifically in our villages. Um, these are our contact information, and you can follow us on Instagram to see even more projects, uh, what we're doing, what we're coming up with. And I'll conclude with this. This is where your part comes. How can you contribute? How do you want to support? How can you help? This, uh, in, in addition to contributions of donations, of uh, sponsorship, you can also be directly impacting and affecting and contributing. We are looking for people to support us and help us in marketing and fundraising and in archiving um, in the region. So if anybody wants to join, please contact us and join our team. Let's together educate, enable, and empower our young Assyrians and women and children and indigenous Assyrian families so we can be a strong nation, indigenous nation, and thrive in our homelands. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. My name is Rena Salem, former, formerly Abro. Um, so I'm going to spend like a couple slides talking about what we do and then I'm going to kind of help lead us into the workshop activity which is idea generation and implementation like how are how can we implement our dreams in the homeland like I'm sure you all have something that you wish you could see something that you think about more than something else like each person has something that's closest to their heart as an issue and so um, I'm just going to take you kind of through how some of our projects happened. Um, so I've been with Shlama since its founding. I'm a co-founder for about, um, in two months, it's going to be eight years. Um, so basically when ISIS happened. Um, and until recently, I have not really been focused on anything else in the community. So I've just been Shlama, Shlama, Shlama. And um, recently I've gotten interested into um, actually seeds and agriculture, and I joined the Iraqi Seed Collective, and that's a whole other story. So I'm gonna, just so you know, whoever's interested, we can talk later. <laughs> um, so Shlama was founded August 4th. Um, we have completed 237 projects so far in 60 locations. Um, these are our categories, emergency response. We're always going to keep that category, even though um, most things have stabilized, you could say, compared to how it started. Um, and, but emergencies always come up. That category will always exist. You never know what's going to happen. Um, youth activities and education, community development, um, which is anything that benefits like the whole community, the whole village or the whole town. Economic initiatives, which we recently broke that category out of community development, which as you saw from um, Savina and Dr. Antoine, economic initiatives are very important right now. Um, cultural preservation, which we unfortunately have paid probably the least attention to um, because of how many needs there are. And that's definitely one of them, and we always want to do more there. And it's just been awesome seeing what everybody's doing at this conference. Um, housing and supporting our troops. So there's laws that we have to follow as an organization registered in the United States. We cannot actually send, we cannot donate a lot of things to the soldiers, including we can't donate bulletproof vests, we can't donate cleaning products because they could be turned into things. We can't donate a lot of things. But what we can do is we can support them with their other needs 
so that they can use their income and salary on whatever they, they actually need. So, um, like, for example, they've needed, like, um, jackets because they keep 24-hour watch over the villages. It gets cold at night. They've needed, like, storage space for their stuff. They've needed um, boots, whatever. Like, whatever they need, we tell them, let us know. Um, they're very, like, humble. They never ask for much. And then um, if you want to see all of our projects, every single one we've done since we started, you can find that at shlama.org slash projects. And that's where I'll tell you how Shlama started, which was actually innovative, which is one of the words that's part of the idea generation. Um, uh, the whole reason that we even started Shlama is because after Daesh happened, we were protesting in Detroit in front of the federal building, and there was five of us that were organizing it. And um, one of them was our friend that was visiting from Iraq. His name is Noor Mehti. You guys might have heard of him in our videos. And he, a bunch of people were giving him money, like, please, please take this to my aunt, take this to my sister, take this to my whatever, because all of our people were displaced where he lives in Ankawa. A lot of our people were in Ankawa and Dahuk. And actually, before, before he even went back to Iraq, a lot of them were in the Nineveh Plains, because Nineveh Plains was not evacuated yet. Um, so... Um, this was at this point when Shlama was founded, only Mosul was evacuated. So everyone's giving him money, and then we were like, we can't just protest, we have to do something else. And then we said, okay, why don't we just take some of these donations and go help people, you know? Like, and then our response from Michigan was, that's not going to work. Like, there's huge trust issues. Nobody wants to send money to Iraq. For good reason, honestly, Iraq was ranked one of the least transparent countries by Transparency International at the time that we were talking about this. And people had good reason to not trust the destin the path. So the whole reason the organization started was because we were like, okay, that's messed up. Like we can't even help our people financially if we want to, because we don't know if it's going to get there. So we just wanted to come up with a pathway. And that's how the organization started. We just made a website. We're like, okay, what can we do? We can show pictures. We can show videos. We can show receipts. We can say their name in the video. Like, thank you, you. <laughs> I don't know. Sargon. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for this donation. This is what we did with it. Look, you know, like we were like, how can we make it as clear as possible that it went from A to B? And um, right now we're not as intense as we were, but every single project is documented on that page, every single one since we started. And um, you guys can go take a look at that. Um, so I'm only going to focus. There's a lot of projects. You can look at them on your own time, but I'm just going to focus on some of our biggest projects. When I, mean, when I mean that they're big, I mean financially, time, effort, the work involved, like these were the biggest projects. Um, and they all came from community ideas. They didn't come from our board meetings. They came from community ideas. The first one was our solar program. That came from a guy named Faiz Yono, and I'll tell you more about him in a second. The next one was our soccer league, which just wrapped up. If you guys are following our social media, you saw the excitement in the homeland about that. It came from uh, Gibi Dawood. He's in Chicago. And then the village purchase came from my husband, Chris Salem. And I'll tell you guys um, all about these three. So this is very basic, general ways to help. This is like, if you don't have time, I know you're all working on a million things. This is a room full of leaders. You're all busy. So if you don't have that much time, these are the easiest ways to kind of give back. The first thing is digitally interacting with the organizations that you support. Sorry. Um, you, people don't realize how important it is. Like, I just turn my notifications on when, like, Shlama posts stuff, and I just go drop my likes because I'm not always involved in all the posting. We have other volunteers doing stuff. Um, just no one will be offended if you don't like our stuff, <laughs> but dropping a simple like moves it up on everybody's feeds, and then the organization will get more visibility other people will be able to see it. Other people that do have time might be able to give more time, donations, energy, effort, at least see what's going on, at least connect with our homeland. So a simple like is the easiest, least time-consuming thing that people can do for every organization you love and support, whatever they are. Um, just digital interaction, saying nice job, whatever. I do that on our own post. I don't do it all the time. Whenever I see it, I just drop something in there. Um, and then fundraising or awareness campaigns. This event is an awareness campaign. We are learning of what's going on. F to be able to have, if you're, if you're in a group somewhere in some um, kind of organization or church group or a university group or whatever, and you have, a, you have an audience and you have an opportunity to educate about who we are, that's raising awareness. 
That's where you can mention different organizations working on stuff so that we can direct resources to our community because like they mentioned as well, we are definitely not able to meet our needs. Like we are not able to meet our needs. And that's part of the reason we're able to honestly work so well together, I think. Also maybe the new generation, but like we know there's enough work for everyone and there's just a lot to do. So um, raising awareness, just speaking, about what's going on is really helpful. Fundraising, if you have a lot of friends, go to a cocktail bar, charge 10 bucks, whatever. <laughs> um, expanding your network. If you're somebody that likes to make connections, growing your own network is so powerful. Just me making connections, making connections. Eventually, when you need help with something and our people are in need and you call up all of your friends and family and loved ones and say, hey, I need help, this is happening right now, they're gonna come through and you're going to be able to have more impact. And then um, also building your network in the homeland, which is pretty challenging, but we have such so many social media resources now. Send that DM, talk to them, ask them what life is like and what they need and learn about it. Expanding your network is very valuable. Um, and then all of these organizations need administrative support, which is accounting. Uh, like a lot of people don't realize that all of these organizations are being managed behind the scenes with not the people that are all in the videos. It's the accounting, the um, like registrations and grant writing and social media posting and, and all of that data management. Um, that's all administrative support. And which is actually easy for, easier for busy people that are on the computer all day because it's like an extra task. And then um, project implementation, you obviously have to be in the homeland to do that. That's actually making the projects happen. And then um, considering jobs that impact our community. So if, if you're like not really sure what you want to do next in your career, um, there are so many jobs in DC that, are, that directly impact our community. Or at least you, you learn such high level organizational things that you can apply to our community. And that could be in any of your jobs, honestly. And even locally, like for example, um, we're from Sterling Heights and like the community is everywhere you look, it's our people. Like every inch of the city is like our people, our stores. And we actually have some like water issues there. We don't have the cleanest water in the city. Like if we had people working locally, trying to make sure that, you know, like even in, in the diaspora, like we have a lot of issues that we all need to be active and involved just because it's not our like, ancient village, it's our modern village, and uh, you know, so those are general ways to help, and I'm gonna fly through the rest. <laughs> um, there are, these are the idea, first, the, there are some people that are idea people. I'm one of those people. I can come up with like 50 ideas on the spot, but that's not enough. Having the great idea is not even close to enough. You, you have to, you need influence, investment, and innovation to make it happen, to make sure that it can become a reality. So, Shlama Green Energy. The idea was this man, his name was Faiz Yono, he was a energy manager at Chrysler for over 20 years. He got his engineering degree from Baghdad, came to America, did the equivalent stuff that he had to do, became very successful at Chrysler. Chrysler North America, all the plants in the country, he made them more environmentally efficient. He noticed that California has as much sunlight hours as Iraq. Um, and so he said, okay, Iraq would be a great candidate for solar energy. I want to go see. I want to go see what it's like. He came on the mission trip with us um, with Shlama, looked around, started taking notes. We came back and he just had his notes. Then some influence came into the picture. Um, uh, Mike Pence and now Kamala Harris are uh, technically, um, they oversee USAID. So a bunch of our leaders, including literally like bishops, went over there in person, met with Mike Pence and said, we're not seeing a single penny. We know Assyrian Aid Society was advocating, Assyrian Policy Institute. A lot of people were advocating for this issue is like, you're saying on TV that we're getting stuff, but we are showing you on the ground that there is nothing. Like I still remember Ikea donated like 150,000 mattresses. Until today, people are using those mattresses. So like we could see what we were getting and what we were not getting. And we were not seeing this aid that they were claiming was coming to us. And it was going through the UN, which is very, 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 very bureaucratic and slow. So then they changed the rules. They said from now on, aid is going to go through these faith-based and small local organizations. But it's, it's a lot of work because we are not at the level of having a, a huge paid staff like these other organizations that receive grants. And so 
they considered us incapable of handling a grant. So they designed a smaller grant where they would work with us side by side, and that was the first and largest grant that we ever got, which was the solar grant. And um, it took a lot of work. We were actually worked with Miss Josephine Atisha here. She currently works with the Syrian Aid Society. Um, she currently works with the Syrian Aid Society, and she has such a great philosophy that she wants all of our organizations to have access to funding so that we can do great things. And she works in grants, and she's very talented. Um, and then uh, next, we needed some investment, obviously, to do all that time. It took a lot of time, a lot of time. Engineering consulting, grant consulting. We had to um, find engineers in Iraq. We had to find female engineers in Iraq. It's already hard to find female engineers in America sometimes, honestly. We had to find them in Iraq, and we did. And they were amazing, honestly, the best engineers ever. And then uh, marketing. We had to figure out how to make it sustainable. When US aid is gone, is it going to keep existing, this project? Um, so investment was needed. That's when you start putting a lot of work into it. And then innovation. It's some, it has to be something, if, if it was easy, somebody would have done it already. It has to be something like innovative, unique, like something that's going to transform the way that people think over there, that, that's going to um, you know, share, share what we've learned or maybe share what they've learned with us, like some, some kind of new, unique bridge idea and... You know, I, maybe I'm not describing it the best way. Okay, football league. Another guy. His name was um, Gilbert. He goes by Gibby Dawood in, in Chicago. He's a soccer coach, experienced soccer coach. He had this dream. He wanted to see an adult soccer league. And he said, these young people, if there's an adult team, they're going to have something to aspire to when they're playing soccer. I want to be in the adult league, you know. And um, he's, he knew that what it would take to do it because he's experienced in the field. So we had the idea. We had the expertise. We needed influence. This guy was connected. He has a large network in the community from teaching soccer for so many years, knew a bunch of families, a bunch of people passionate about soccer. And he was able to fundraise most of the whole thing. And um, that's where investment came in, money and then time. There was a lot of, um, it was so hard to do it from here. So we recruited new volunteers in the homeland and um, they were just amazing. Volunteers that came straight from the athletic clubs and all the different villages. This, this project ended up even legitimizing those athletic clubs even more. Seeing who put more practice into it, seeing who was more organized, seeing what needs the athletic clubs had so that they could participate this year or next year. Um, and then innovation. Um, obviously, soccer leagues exist, you know? So you're like, what's so innovative about a soccer league? It didn't exist there. So somebody saw that missing thing and said, okay, this is, could really be transformative, and I see how it's going to be transformative because he's in the field. Us as the board members, we are not soccer players. We're not involved in soccer. We don't know anything about soccer, but we have to be open to people that bring in new ideas that can transform things over there. And lastly, but not least, is Gurmawa. So we learned from a former Shlama board member. Her name is Renee Kasha, amazing girl. She said Gurma was about to be sold to two weeks. They said there's uh, potential buyers lined up, ready to buy it, supposedly. We tried to communicate with them and didn't. Um, so it was crazy. We found some pro bono lawyers um, from our community in Iraq, in Baghdad. They came and helped us out. They went to Mosul. They communicated with the landowner. Um, they, we got extension after extension, reduction after reduction in the cost of it. Um, eventually, the man, because the people of Gurmawa have lived there since the genocide. They're originally from Ashitha. They built the town with their bare hands. They, however, in the 30s and 40s, um, Iraq allowed people to purchase land in Iraq when Iraq after Iraq became a country, so that they could populate the country. So this guy, this family that owned the land, he was an Arab from Mosul. His family just innocently bought land, but it was like all the land around Gurmawa. And um, he was just a business owner. He actually did not bother the people all those years. The people of Gurmawa were farming the land every year and getting, um, he was taking 10%. You know, it's like owning a commercial building or something. He was taking 10%. Recently, he's been taking 33% and making them pay all the expenses. They were already struggling financially. He just said, at the end, I'm over it. It's not a good business investment. I'm not making any money. The government's not paying me for all the product. I want to sell it. So that's all that was in his head. He didn't care about heritage or whatever. He's just a businessman. So then um, we told him we finally made an agreement with him. I don't know how he agreed. I guess loyalty for all those years. $800,000. Um, influence, Mayor Basim Balu found uh, three 
uh, investors who purchased most of the land. Chris hustled his butt off, got every family, friend, relative overposted on Shnama's thing like every single day, a million posts. Like we exhausted our network to the point where we saw the same people donating two, three times. So we realized our network needed to grow. That's why I mentioned network earlier, grow your networks. And so um, he ended up raising, out of the two million we originally tried to raise, even though we only needed 800,000, we raised about 42,000. <laughs> and the, the uh, thing that may, drove him, he's like, we can't just look back later and say, oh, the land sold and we didn't even try to do anything at all. He's like, even if we fail, we have to try. We have to at least try this experiment. And it miraculously worked. And uh, we proved that land acquisition is possible through purchases. And those three investors, are they already owned farmland in Iraq. They already know how to manage it. They know how to handle it. They know how to make money off of it. They just added more to their farmland. That's it. And they promised not to sell it to non Suraya too. And then uh, that's it for that. OK, this is the last slide. Um, we're going to break off into like a workshop um, that um, Savina, Dr. Antoine, and myself thought about um, uh, earlier and uh, basically now it's your turn to think about what's close to you um, to generate ideas here are some issues that we're facing they also had some up on their slides um, I don't know if you guys want to put them up or whatever you want to do but um, think about what issue is like close to your heart that that you've heard today or that you already know of that you would like to solve and then um, we're going to pass around these workshop worksheets, and you guys are going to have like a good amount of time to think about it um, and try to think of ideas and what it would take to make that idea a reality. And, and just keep in mind, from our experience in these organizations, you have an opportunity to share those ideas with us, and we'll be able to tell you the common obstacles that we face with these ideas. It doesn't have to be something crazy that nobody's ever heard of. OK, like when I mean innovative, just something that you see that's missing that we could use that could help our people. Raman Realty provides real estate services in Santa Clara, San Mateo, San Francisco and Contra Costa counties. Whether you're getting ready to buy or sell in the middle of it or just looking for some answers, we are here to help. Our goal is to provide the best insight, tools and deliver the best financial results. Our innovative listing plan benefits our clients by providing a full-service MLS listing without paying the high real estate commissions. Our home buying plans are also designed to pass huge savings to our buyers. To learn more about our special offers and services, please either visit our website www.ramanrealty.com or contact Raman Mirzapur at 408-499-8957, email raman at ramanrealty.com Pay the lowest fees, sell for the highest price, and net maximum proceeds.